good little boys and girls aren't on the internet at this hour, I son. Yes. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield. Truly, you have a dizzying intellect. And Big Anklevich. Moron. Shalom Aleichem. L'chaim. Yes. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 105. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Thank you for joining us once again. That's right. Big, what's on the menu for today? Well, on the menu, we've got some lox and bagels, a nice deli sandwich, and a story called Emmett, Joey, and the Beals by Ralph Sevish. All right. It's been a long time in coming, so I guess we should go for it, right? Sure. Ralph Sevish has been an attorney with the Dramatists Guild of America since 1997, and their executive director and general counsel since June 2005. Mr. Sevish began his professional writing career with a movie column for Worlds of If magazine, entitled The Savage Cinema, and continues as a sporadic writer of stuff. In addition to his many articles on the theater industry published by The Dramatists magazine, he wrote an award-winning play, Little One Goodbye. Emmett, Joey, and the Beals, originally published by Abyss and Apex, was named one of the best online fantasy stories of 2006, and was later republished by Kaleidotrope on actual paper in October 2008. About the time that he submitted this to us. Emmett, Joey, and the Beals by Ralph Savish Emmett's story. So there I was, in yet another brawl at Muldoon's Bar and Grill. And while the joker swinging the bike chain was trying to indenturate my skull, Joey was still over by the bar, chatting up some pickled geezer, yammering on and on about quantum mechanics. You can never know where subatomic particles really are, is what Joey was saying in his usual spiel. All you can figure out are the odds that they're in some given range of location. And since people are made up of subatomic particles, then a person's reality is only probabilistic. Yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. Now, I don't know much about quantum mechanics, but when the steel toe of that fat biker's jackboot kicked my jewels up into my throat... I felt like I was going to puke out of my eye, and I knew Joey was wrong. There ain't nothing probable about white-hot pain. It's simply a fact of life, and no Poindexter's theory makes it hurt any less. But I had it coming to me anyways. I mean, you try and make time with a biker chick, and you've got to expect some pain in your life one way or another. You generally don't expect to taste your nuts simply for complimenting a lady on a tattoo, but life is full of surprises. Besides, the fella apologized later. I think he realized he might have overreacted a little and probably felt bad about it. He felt especially bad when I stuck the business end of my 38 deep into his nose and made him sing Barnacle Bill the Sailor. Then I joined in. Me and Joey both. We all had a grand time. After that, the fellow with the high caliber nasal passages, well, him and me got to chatting too, all friendly like. We talked baseball and then started comparing our tattoos. Even Joey showed off that weird little thingy on his chest that he don't even remember getting. It looks like a pregnant snake giving a blowjob to a yak. Joey likes to laugh at the one I got in my arm up by my shoulder. It's my name, misspelled by some drunken artiste. I don't remember getting it either. But I kind of like that tat. 
It reminds me of the stupid stuff I do when I get drunk. And I need reminding from time to time. Well, anyways, the next day, Joey found me while I was making my rounds. Hey, Emmett! He says. Get your fat ass over here. I have news! Here he was, right on time, looking for his morning fix. But today, he was all excited. Just like he used to get in the old days. Like he had a tip for me that would keep him in smack for weeks. Calm yourself, Joseph, says I, all business-like. What's got you hopping, Hoppy? I have news about peels, says he, real quiet. When Joey said that, I just kept walking. I mean, here we were, standing on the corner of Avenue C and East 3rd, and this junkie says Beals to me, just like that, just like nothing. What a bobo. Someday, I'm going to scrape Joey off the bottom of my shoe, and that'll be that. But for now, I think I'll just head back to Muldoon's. I need an eye-opener. Bad. The Journal of Judah Lowe The great Rabbi Bezalel has finally completed my training. He has imparted to me his knowledge of the mystical arts and secret alchemies of Kabbalah, deciphered from the sacred book, the Book of Splendor, the Sefir Yetzirah, the Zohar. It is said by some that the Zohar was written by the hand of God, revealing Yahweh's secrets for the creation of life. Others say that Bezalel wrote the sacred book himself, that he is really a being as old as our faith, existing throughout time as an eternal aspect of the mind of God. But wiser men say nothing at all, as these things should not be spoken of. From the Journal of Judah Lowe, Rabbi of Prague, 1582. Joey's Story The big sweaty lummox that is Emmett Kowalchuk used to be of value to me when he wore a badge. He was powerful, amoral, and unrelenting. He was also an alcoholic of megalithic proportions, a propensity that made it necessary, in the end, that he be removed from his position as an agent of law enforcement. I did have something to do with his downfall, but I really don't want to talk about that. Actually, I can't, because I've scorched the details from my mind. But let's just say we all do things of which we are later ashamed. Like becoming associated with that dark creature Emmett calls Da Beals. And no, I will not discuss that now either, thank you very much. Once upon a time, I taught mathematics to the snotty scions in New England. I lived a quiet and solitary existence on an island of old money from whence I had already started to drift. Then I left the old world behind and sailed off on the deep, dark waters of the urban sea. When the tide withdrew, I had washed up in hell and had no way home, so I swam back out into the strong current, hoping to be pulled under. And I was. I float now from shadow dream to fevered nightmare and back again. I still read quite a bit, though. Not my special book, of course. I have hidden that one away for a rainy day. No, now it's mostly pornographic comic books featuring young Asian girls being raped by robots. My attention span doesn't permit me much more. I recently tried rereading Camus' L'Etranger, but I discovered that I could no longer read French. The words were just squiggly lines on the page, twisting and cavorting for no apparent reason, and I couldn't seem to make them stop. So, Camus and Pollock and Stravinsky and Heisenberg, and anyone I ever loved or whoever loved me, have all been replaced by a syringe. And by Emmett. That lumbering fool Emmett, who seems like he's always been right there next to me in the shadows. And now he keeps me fixed as the need arises. God knows why. Guilt, maybe. Or maybe he thinks we're friends. Maybe he thinks he's doing me a favor. Or maybe he's just trying to kill me. Emmett's story continued. Muldoon's is owned by this fellow Heb, I know. Old Jew Muldoon, and he has this slightly retarded fella, Jesus, who cleans up and sleeps in the bar to look after things. Jesus pours me a shot of JD with a rye egg every morning, and gives me a place to be for a while. In return, 
I provide some services for the old man. Debt retrieval services. Joey won't let up this morning, what with this Beals crap. So I get him loaded and off to La La Land he goes, stretched out on Jesus's cot. As for me, I stare down at the egg in my jack, and it's staring back at me like the yellow eye I popped out of somebody's head once down on Canal. What was that guy's name? Eddie. Eddie, Eddie Flegner. <laughs> Always had that runny, roomy yellow eye. Till I popped it out. Well, that was back in my bad days, back when I first met the Beals. I was out of control, easy to piss off and hard to buy back then. Lots of bourbon under the bridge and over the dam since, and a lot has changed. You see, I'm pretty easy to buy now. The Beals bought me once, I sort of remember. The price wasn't that high, and he paid it easy, and, and then he owned me. Still does, I guess. I'm not really sure anymore about the details, and if he's back looking for me, my life has just gotten nastier. Hell, I've been shot, stabbed, worked over with a tire iron, and run over by a Cadillac doing 80 through my living room, and I ain't dead yet. But Beals. Key Riced. Okay, stop your belly aching, Emmett. Mama Kowalchuk didn't raise no whiner. And at least shit storms are exciting. Emmett and Joey, a conversation. Up, Joseph. Up! I haul Joey up from Jesus' cot and lean him up against the end of the bar. His body sags and his head flops over like a puppet with its strings cut. Emmett, Emmett, go away. Come again some other day. He sings songs. Beals, Joey. You said Beals to me. Right out there on the street. So now you have to pull yourself together and start talking. Lest you want me to have to beat it out of you like the old days. Because if you're getting nostalgic on me, Hoppy... I'll be happy to oblige. Joey blinks, like he's trying to focus. Beals? Yes. Uh, But now I'm having such a lovely hallucination. So, could you just... Sorry, Joe. You've been there, and I done that. Now I need to start making plans. For plans, I need the 411. You seem to know something. So now I need to know it, too. I grab his collar and pull his face up to mine, close enough he could floss with my nose hairs. Otherwise, I'll just put you down like the sick dog you are and hightail it to the hinterlands. Staten Island, maybe. I guess I hit a nerve because Joey perks right up. Yes, right, Mr. Kowalchuk. Beals would never find you in that landfill masquerading as a burrow. In fact, with your stench, you'll fit right into that compost heap of a... That, Joseph, as you may remember, was my short left jab. Now, if you want the hard right cross, just keep stalling. Emmett, may I have a napkin, please? A trail of blood and snot runs down Joey's face. I swipe a pile of cocktail napkins from up on the bar and throw them at him. Here. Thank you. He mumbles as he wipes his nose. Ah, don't mention it. Where were we? Beals, I say with the Z rattling through my gritted teeth. Joey takes a long breath. Some of my, uh, compatriots have seen a long black stretch limo creeping around the neighborhood. They saw it slow down one time to ask one of the boys a question. A door opened, the guy was pulled in, and the car sped off. At least, that's what I heard. A junkie disappeared into the back of a black stretch limo? Yes. And that's it? Uh, no. The license plate. It was BCL-777. From out of state. And you think that was the Beals? Well, who else? Don't you see? He's finally tracking us down. He wants his payment, or whatever. I let go of Joey's collar. Bullshit, Joe, I say. Not sure at all it's bullshit. Fine. I just thought you should know. So now you do. It's nothing to me if you're not going to do anything about it. More bullshit. So you just want me to cover your ass, just like always. And so? After all I've done for you? Joey looks away and wipes his nose again. (sighs) All you've done for... I can taste bile, so I stop talking. You know, sometimes I just want to put a pillow over your face, pull out my piece, and put a nice quiet hole right in the middle of that skeevy mug of yours. Joey goes limp. Well, sometimes... Sometimes I want that, too. 
Yeah, well. Anyway, I'll check into the limo thing. It's probably just some junkie behind in his payments, and so some Colombians took him for a joyride. But uh, I'll check it out, J just to put your mind at ease, okay? If it is Beals, we're going to have to move quickly and quietly. Otherwise, he's going to come and send us straight to hell. I stand up. I'm a Jew. We don't believe in hell. It would be, what do you call, redundant. Joey looks up with his puppy dog eyes. Do you know exactly what... Just stay out of sight for a while. Don't go to your usual alleys. Stay away from your flop and mine. We'll both stay away from Muldoon's, too. You sound like you're starting to take this seriously. Well, better play it safe till we know. Joey starts to shake a little. If you go to Staten Island without me, I... I don't know what I'll... Ah, uh, easy there, little man. I ain't been run out of town yet. I'm too old, fat, and slow to run that far anyway. Please, just... Just don't leave me here alone. Find a new hole. I help Joey to his feet. When the coast is clear, I'll come get you. Joey holds on to the edge of the bar. Give me a word. Yeah, okay. For whatever that's worth. Thank you, Emmett. Don't sweat it, Joseph. Emmett, Alice, and Donald R. Belzon, Esquire. Two Conversations. Mr. Kowalczyk's office? Mr. Kowalczyk, please. Whom shall I say is calling? Donald R. Belzon, attorney at law, calling on behalf of my client, Dr. Abraham Bezalel. I'm sorry, but Mr. Kowalczyk is not currently available. Would you like to leave a message? Thank you, miss. Please let him know that my client has asked me to negotiate with Mr. Kowalczyk regarding the final terms of their arrangement. Would you like to leave a number where you can be reached, Mr. Belson? No, I'll get a hold of Mr. Kowalczyk at some other time. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thanks, Alice. That was perfect. I stretch out under the covers. No sweat, Emmy. Alice is chewing her gum like she means it. So you're forwarding all your calls here now? Just for a little while, till this blows over. And change the message on your answering machine, okay? Sure. Okay. For ten bucks. Ten? A day. A day? I sit up so quick I hit my head on the shelf above the bed. You mean on top of... Yeah. She pops a gum in my face. On top. Okay. One week in advance, payable now. She holds out her hand. Yeah, yeah, okay. I already knew Alice could screw a guy six ways from Sunday, but this was the seventh. I pull my pants off the floor and check through my pockets. I find a handful of sawbucks and toss them at her. Here. She snatches the bills out of the air, counts up the money, and right away turns cheerful. Thanks, Em. Gee, I'm sure sorry you got a lawyer after you. That sucks. Those guys are pit bulls, you know. Alice, you have no idea. I'm stuck between the devil and the deep blue sea. Now come back to bed, sweet cheeks. I've still got three minutes left on the meter. Oh, you sweet talker. <laughs> Emmett's story continued. Well, I just got saved a lot of wear and tear on my old gum shoes. It seems Joey was right. The Beals was back and he was looking for us. With bells on yet. Crap. But I guess I should have seen that coming because the Beals always said that when the end came, he'd be there. With bells on. I was probably being watched right this second. Here, and at Muldoon's, and at Joey's Hole, everywhere. Everywhere I usually go, I couldn't go no more. Phones are probably tapped, too. And Alice, my sweet whore Alice, she's probably the one that tipped Beals. And then she took my 70 bucks just as an extra kick in the head. Maybe I should snap a neck like a dry twig. But, uh, why bother? She's a good kid, and either way I'm gonna have to haul ass. And Joey... I should find Joey. Or maybe not. Maybe there's no time to worry about that ferret anymore. Every man for himself, maybe. Damn, this old tattoo is starting to itch like crazy.
Joey's story continued. Hi, this is Alice Niedemeyer. You've reached the offices of Kowalchuk Investigations. Please leave a message at the tone. <laughs> Have a nice day. Hello, Emmett. I know you're there. Pick up. Pick up, pick up, pick up, pick up! This is no time to have a horse screen in your calls, you fat, stupid, kite bastard! Okay, okay, Emmett, please, please pick up the phone. I'm sorry. I won't call you fat anymore, I promise. Only please, pick up the phone! He's gone. I bet he just took off. Without a word or a how do you do? I knew he would. Promise and no promise. In the end, I always knew I'd be alone. Utterly and completely alone, waiting for Beals to collect me. And now it's time, and here I am, with only a rash on my damn tattoo for company. I saw the black limo again. It may have seen me too. I'm not sure. But I saw it. It's real. Not some opiatic fever dream, but really real. You know something? Wisconsin is nice this time of year. Almost as nice as New Hampshire, in fact. In Wisconsin, they got cheese and other dairy products and cows that give milk as sweet as the girls milking them. Big, healthy, blonde, corn-fed Aryan girls. And lakes deep and clear surrounded by green fields. Madison. Madison, Wisconsin is a nice college town. Maybe I can get a job there again. But I can't walk to Wisconsin. The ulcers on my feet wouldn't get me past Hoboken. And that damn book is too damn heavy to carry that far. Maybe I could make it back to New Hampshire. I bet I still have relatives there somewhere. But I'd never get past their security gates. In point of fact, it would seem my options are fairly limited. It's either kill myself or... Wait a second. Wait, wait, wait. It's really Emmett that Beals wants, isn't it? I mean... Technically, I was part of the deal, too. I, I think. I'm really kind of hazy on the details. But if I can set up Kowalczyk for him, maybe I can get out of this. After all, it's every man for himself. And as Fassbinder noted, God against all. Joey and Belzon. A Conversation. Mr. Belzon? I query tremulously into the phone. A smooth voice replies, drowning the static. Yes? This is Joey. Um, Joe? Joseph. Mr. Joseph Lowe. I swallow and lean my head against the grimy phone booth. I hear you've been looking for me? I mean, that is, Mr. Beals has? Dr. Bezalel has given me instructions to close the deal, Mr. Lowe. So why don't you make it easier for everybody and come down to my office and we'll discuss... I've got a new deal to make, Mr. Belzon. Really? Well, I don't think Dr. Bezalel will be at all... I'll give you Emmett Kowalchuk on a silver platter without a fuss. Yes, well, that's nice, but I think we can handle... And, and the book. I can get you the book. The book? Really? In exchange for a free pass... There is a pause on the other end of the line. I see. I clear my throat. <clears throat> and cough fare to Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Madison, Wisconsin, yes. Static crackles during another pause. Yes, I see. Well? Well, I'll take your offer to my client. He might be interested. We'll see, Mr. Lowe. I can't make you any promises, you understand. I understand, Mr. Belzon. I reply with feigned dignity. Give me your number and I'll call you back tomorrow morning, he says. I stare at the receiver lying there cold in my sweaty hand. Well, I'm between phones right now. I'll call you tomorrow. Uh, around 9 a.m.? That'll be fine, Judah. You have my number, apparently. Yes, I do. And my name isn't Judah. It's Joe.
Rabbi Lowe and the Golem of Prague. The following is excerpted from the Golem Stories by Professor Josiah Lowenstein, Wisconsin University Press. But wiser men say nothing at all, as these things should not be spoken of. From the Journal of Judah Lowe, Rabbi of Prague, 1582. And it came to pass that Lowe, who was a good and decent man, heard the cries of his people, the Jews of Prague, who were decimated by hate, by deprivation, by pogrom. He studied the sacred Zohar to find their salvation and, after many days and nights, he attempted the creation of a golem, a soulless creature in the figure of a man shaped from simple clay. It would offer his people their only hope of survival. Joey's story continued. I shouldn't have done it. Every inch of my mottled flesh screamed a warning to me to avoid this obvious setup. But what choice did I have, really? Beals would find me eventually, and I would then be at the old man's mercy. This way, I meet him on my terms. And if I live long enough to make a deal, I might live long enough to regret it thereafter. To live with regret, after all, is still to live. Even in Wisconsin. The next morning, I, um, ran some errands. Then I met the limo at the corner of Avenue C and East 5th Street around 3 p.m. When I got in, the tinted glass left me in semi-darkness and blind as to who was driving. For all I knew, there was no driver. The car finally stops in front of the synagogue up on 5th Avenue, an elegant establishment where the regulars pay extra to sit close to God on the high holy days. I stumble out of the dark car into the bright light of the late afternoon. Despite the heat of the sun, an intense chill runs through my body. I can see Belzon waiting for me on the marble stairs that lead up to the temple's massive doors. He leads me inside where I'm suddenly frozen by the light streaming through the Chagall windows from above. The deep reds of the stained glass put me in mind of the blood of the innocents, spilled over and over throughout time. And the light blues recall the sky as seen by a sea of dead, empty eyes staring lifelessly up from their mass graves. We enter a private room off the vestibule just inside the doors. There sits Bezalel, unchanged since I last saw him. When, seven years ago? His long beard partly obscures his white, dapper seersucker suit off the rack from another time and place. He wears the same black derby and smokes a cigar. His blue-blue eyes match the stained glass windows and they gleam with some inner fire. Hello, Judah. Good to see you. Hello, Doctor. Um, it's Joseph, not Judah. Surely you must remember. Indeed I do. He smiles, bearing sharp white teeth. Um, yes. Well, you look the same. Yes, but you look different, Judah. Older, and something else besides. Scared? I offer, with utmost sincerity. No, you were always scared, Judah. Worn away, perhaps. Yes, perhaps. Why doesn't he just get on with it? Bells on interjects. The book, Mr. Lowe. You said you could deliver the book. The good doctor laughs. (laughs) Please, Belzan. Mr. Lowe is just settling in. You see, Judah? Lawyers. Fat. No, I understand, doctor. He just wants to get down to business. I can respect that. It's just that I need certain assurances. Bezalel smiles almost kindly. Of course, of course. But first, a gesture of good faith, yes? You must assist us in neutralizing a met. Then the location of the book and the logistics of your freedom can be discussed in detail. I am puzzled. Emmet? Oh, you mean Emmet? Well, he'll not be easy to neutralize. He's a big, mean, drunken, heavily armed, soulless killing machine. And I have no idea where he is. Maybe Staten Island, but 
Emmet remains soulless still? That's so sad, Judah. Not wholly unexpected, but sad nonetheless. Your sacrifice was for naught, it seems. Sacrifice? What sacrifice? What was for naught? Your deal with me. Well, I don't really remember the um, exact terms of the deal, so... Of course not. Neither does Emmet. That was part of the deal, too. I'm not feeling well, Bezalel. Stop talking in circles. Belzon hands me a drink to steady me. I knock it back without thinking. It smells of flowers. I'm remembering lilacs in a garden. And suddenly I'm spinning into a funnel, spiraling down. I wake up on the floor with Belzon sitting on top of me. He has a bejeweled dagger in his hand, and I can't move. The drink has left me paralyzed. Belzon rips open my shirt. Without a moment of hesitation, he cuts the tattoo from my chest with a single parabolic swipe of his blade. I would scream if my throat could form words. Suddenly, a torrent of images floods my mind. As the world falls away, I circle back into memory. Rabbi Lowe and the Golem of Prague continued. Lowe drew his charts, calculated his numbers, spoke his incantations, made his prayers, and with the elements of fire, water, wind, and earth, fashioned a man out of the mud of the riverbank. No, not a man, a golem. Onto its arm he carved the word emet, truth, in the ancient tongue. This would bind the creature to Lo, giving him dominion over it. Seven times the rabbi circled the golem. Shanti, shanti, dachat, dachat, he said. Then into its ear, Lo whispered Yahweh's unspoken name. And the golem opened its eyes. Silent and mighty, the golem defended the Jews of Prague. But lacking a soul, the golem had no mercy, no compassion, no humanity. And in exercising a fierce vengeance, it became a monstrous, unstoppable killer. Emmett's story continued. I knew Joey would try something, so I let him try. I lifted Belzon's phone number off Alice's caller ID, and then I made sure to joke about it with Joey. 555-0777, hardy ha ha. The next morning, I staked out Muldoon's, and Joey showed up around 10, carrying that big book of his. I listened at the door as he talked to Jesus. Stay by the phone, Jesus. You might hear from me around 3, 4 this afternoon. I might need you to bring this book to me, you understand? Sure, Joey. I understand. But if you don't hear from me by, say, six, well, then burn the damn thing, okay? Sure, Joey. I burn. Good man. There will be a serious payday in this for you. Thanks. But what I tell Emmett? Nothing. You tell him nothing. But Emmett is you. Nothing. You understand, Jesus? Sure, Joey. I understand. After Joey left, I had a friendly little chat with Jesus. He was happy to turn the book over to me because, you see, I have a way with people. Then I picked up Joey's trail. He got loaded and nodded off for a while behind the Hung Lo's Noodle Emporium. But around three that afternoon, he hopped into a black limo at C and Fifth and took off. Damn. What do you know? There is a black limo. I tossed the book into the back seat of my broken down ragtop El Dorado and followed at a distance. So now I'm double parked up on ritzy Fifth Avenue, and I watch in the rear view as Joey and Belzon go inside a big shell across the street. I sit and wait a while, thumbing through Joey's book. Fancy thingamajig, but it's all Babylonian to me. Meantime, I'm giving Joey a few more minutes to smoke out the beals, to get in good and deep, and then I guess I'll go save his ungrateful ass. What I should be doing is hightailing it over the Verrazano Bridge, pushing this old El Dorado as hard as she'll go, past Staten Island even, to Jersey maybe, maybe even further than that. Just leave, without Joe, without the stink of this life covering me like a skunk coat. Just leave and don't look back. Not ever. 
But no, instead I'm going to go pull Joey's chestnuts out of an open fire. He wouldn't do it for me, probably. So why? Well, maybe it's just because I promised him I would. For whatever that's worth. Because if your word don't mean anything, well then, hell, what kind of man are you? Rabbi Lowe and the Golem continued. But lacking a soul, the Golem had no mercy, no compassion, no humanity. And in exercising a fierce vengeance, it became a monstrous, unstoppable killer. So Bezalel returned to Prague. Lo, the Golem must be stopped. Yes, Master, I have lost control of it. Your control was an illusion from the outset. I see that now, admitted the young rabbi. Remove the sacred word from its arm with this dagger, and the creature shall return to dust. Bezalel advised, offering a knife the likes of which Lo had never seen. Lo turned away. But who will protect us then? We are in God's hands, my son, as we have ever been. But, Bezalel, I... I've lost my faith in God's protection. Don't you see? We must take steps to protect ourselves. Judah, a soulless creature is beyond any man's control. But... But what if... What if it had a soul? Surely then it could be our... Our what? Our savior? The Meshiach? Yes. Blasphemy, Judah. Perhaps so, whispered Lo. Bezalel pondered. And how do you propose it gain this soul? Master, you wrote the book. Surely you could... I wrote nothing, Lo. I am merely a disciple, like yourself. Yes, Master, but isn't there anything in the sacred text that could help us? Within its pages can be found the answer to every question. Evincing a great and damning hubris, Bezalel opened the Zohar and poured over it throughout the night. Outside, the bodies of the righteous and unrighteous alike started stacking up like cords of wood, and the city of Prague became like a funeral pyre, its teeming stench reaching up to the heavens. Finally, Bezalel emerged and spoke. Judah, the golem is connected to you. If I wipe clean your memory, its mind, too, will become a blank slate. And onto that slate, life may yet write a story that leads the golem to a soul. So, what say you? But, Master, what of my life? What of my aged mother and my people? And without my memories, how shall I guide the golem? How shall I advise it? This is your decision your sacrifice to make. I will tend to your congregation and see to your mother's well-being. But you must take your golem and go out into the world. You will teach it to speak, to live like a man. The spell I cast will grant you false memories, ever-changing, so you might both survive the ages with your purpose intact. You will remember nothing but your debt to me, which will always seem but seven years past, as seven is the sacred number and the center of all things. But for how long, Master? A day will come, a day 420 years hence, measuring seven times a lifespan of threescore years, when I shall return and seek you out. If by that time the golem has gained a soul, you shall be restored and live out your days in God's grace, and the golem will become the champion of our people. But if it remains what it is, a soulless creature, uncontrollable and unredeemed, then it shall be returned to the dust, and you shall join it. Lo sighed. Four hundred and twenty years. By that time, our people will be nothing but a memory. We will persevere, Lo. We have always persevered. Lo walked to the window and stared out at the nightmarish spectacle of a violent world descending into chaos. His own silence deafened him. Bezalel spoke once more. So now, what say you, Rabbi Lo of Prague? And Lo whispered, I will do what I can. 
what I must. Basilel then etched upon Lo's chest a sacred glyph, a symbol that would cast the spell and hide the truth from Lo through the ages to come, until the day it was removed. Lo next found himself standing in a Czechoslovakian wheat field beside his mute creation. They were heading down a road, unsure where they were going. After a time, Emmet turned to Lo and said, Emmet's story continued. Hey, Joey, wake the fuck up. Emmet? What are you... Where are... Uh, what is... You're laying here in a pool of your own blood, and you're asking me questions? Where's that prick, Belzan? But, right at that moment, I hear the snake slither up behind me. Golem, release your maker. Rise and face me. Belzan hisses. I sneak Joey the book and tell him to hide it. He tries to tuck it under his coat, but it's too big. And I see the blood on Joey's chest like he's been worked over with a straight edge. Slowly, I turn. Belzan, I whisper. You do this? Belzan points a pretty impressive knife at me, smiles, and says, Yes, Golem, and I'm not done yet. I see something moving in the shadows, out of the corner of my eye. Ah, the Beals finally shows his ugly mug. He says, Wait a moment, Belzan. Lower the dagger. Let us welcome him at home. First, Bealsy, I think you're going to need to get yourself a new shyster, I say, as I pull my thirty-eight, wheel on Belzon, and fire three times point-blank into his chest before anyone can even blink. <laughs> then the Beal starts chanting, Chanty, shanty, da hot, da hot. And I... Joey's story continued. The golem suddenly freezes, its arm extended, its gun pointing in the air, in an empty gesture of accusation. Belzon just smiles his deathless grin as the bloodless holes across his torso instantly close. Bezalel then turns to face me as I stare up, helpless from my prone position on the floor. Now, Judah, come, return the book that you have stolen. It is time to finish this. Rabbi Lowe and the Golem concluded. For 420 years, Judah, now called Joseph, roamed the land with his hulking servant, now called Emmet. They farmed, they soldiered, they sold, traded, bartered, and built. They loved and they hated, they broke, they destroyed, they lied, stole, maimed, and killed. And every seven years, they would begin again, without aging and without memory of the last turn of the wheel, but somehow changed with each incarnation. They walked through time, this man and his creature, like flying Dutchmen doomed to sail in search of something they knew not what. One day, the road led them back to Bezalel, whom they now called Beals. They knew him. Hadn't they made some sort of deal with him only seven years ago? Before he could harm them, Joseph and Emmett succeeded in stealing from Beals his prized possession, a book, over-large, leather-bound, and jewel-encrusted, with letters made from gold leaf, in ancient words that were undecipherable. They would hold it as leverage against Beals, should their paths ever cross again. But... As the years and centuries passed, the book's import slipped from their minds, as their minds slipped into madness and out again, one lifetime after another. They anesthetized themselves against their plight, and their degradation continued. And then seven years after the sixtieth turn of the wheel, the final days came. Joey's story continued. I rise and hand the sacred Zohar to Bezalel. I remember it all now, Master. So many years lost. Centuries burned away. My hopes, my prayers, my dreams, all unanswered. 
And for what? I've made nothing more of the golem than I first did all those years ago in Prague. And I've made so much less of myself. Bezalel opens the book. No recriminations now, my dear Judah. It is time to make an end. We must remove the emet from the golem's arm, so that it may crumble back into the dust. But first the blade must be purified by fire, wind, and water, so when it joins with the earth and clay of the golem's flesh, it is able to complete its task. Bezalel takes the knife from Belzon. Then, as Bezalel recites an incantation from the Zohar, blue flames burst forth from his blue, blue eyes the dagger in a fire that does not burn. When he reads a second passage, Attorney Belzon opens his mouth and releases a mysterious gust of hot air that blows through the chamber. Bezalel holds the knife aloft, and its blade starts to gleam. First fire, then wind, now water, the doctor says, putting his hand on my shoulder. When he reads a third passage from the Book of Wonder, I start to feel woozy and drop to my knees. Suddenly, all of the bile and the sickness I've absorbed through 420 years of misspent life come flowing up out of me in a torrent of fetid liquid, shooting out like a black fountain, retching out of me and onto the blade. I am cleansed, and the blade now glows with a bright white intensity. All is ready. Take the blade, Judah. Cut the word from the flesh of the golem. I? It was yours in the making. It must be yours in the unmaking. Go, make an end. He hands me the knife. I turn to face the golem. It is a creature I've known through various incarnations for a very long time. I made it with my own hands, and with the best of intentions... In the end, it had even returned to save me against all expectations. And now I'm going to destroy it? No, not it. Him. I'm going to destroy him? What kind of soul must I have to do such a thing, I wonder? I'm so sorry, Emmet. Emmet, I mean. I'm sorry for everything, I whisper, raising the blade. His eyes stare into me with something approaching... What? Forgiveness? I cut through Emmett's coat, ripping open the sleeve and the shirt sleeve beneath, exposing his tattooed flesh. I hesitate for only a moment, and then quickly slice the Emmet from his arm. Blood pours forth. Blood? But... How can a golem bleed? Emmett, Joey, and the Beals. Joey is slicing off a chunk of my freaking arm. So I snatch the knife away and toss him aside like a rag doll. Then, quick as a toad answer on crank, I spin and throw and bury the blade up to its hilt in Belzan's forehead. He slumps to his knees with a surprised look on his face, and he folds like a kangaroo straight in a game of stud. He stares up at me from the cold stone floor, and that look on his face. Well, the memory of it is going to give me the giggles for years. If I live for years. Then I turn to the Beals, who looks like he just shit himself. You know, I don't remember ever seeing that wrinkled old bastard look scared before. I raise my thirty-eight, throw the old fella a cute wink, and let loose with the lead. But for the second time today... Nothing. The Beals doesn't show a scratch on him. I stare down at my gun. I gotta have this thing checked. He used to be pretty good at blowing the heads off of cocksuckers. Beals starts his chanting again. Shanti, shanti, dot, dot. But this time it don't do squat to me. So I look over at Joe, who's still kind of freaked. What now, Hoppy? I says. Joey yelps. The knife! Emmett, get the knife! But as soon as I yank the knife out of Belzon's skull, he pops back up like a weeble and starts clutching at me, trying to pull the knife away. So I hack off his arm, slicing clean through at the shoulder. 
And as I'm standing there, holding his disconnectified wing, the rest of Donald R. Belzon Esquire disintegrates into a pile of dust. Poof. Just like that. Shanti. Shanti. Goes the Beals. I use what's left of Belzon's tattooed, still solid arm to knock the Beals upside his head. And I grab him by the throat and squeeze his words until he gags on him. Then I shove that fancy pig sticker right into his chest, quick as a schoolboy squirt. But again, nothing. Shit, what do I gotta do to kill this old man? The book! Emmett, destroy the book! Screams Joey. So I stick the shiv right into the middle of the book and then... Joey's story concluded. A column of flame erupts from the wound in the sacred tome, knocking Emmett to the ground next to me, where I sat frozen. Bezalel, his eyes wide in disbelief, bursts into flame too, and his blue-blue fire intertwines with the red-red flames of the Zohar as the burning, smoking column shoots up through a sudden hole in the roof of the temple, up, up into the late afternoon sky. And then, just as suddenly as the inferno roared to life, the flames are gone. The book drops to the floor, spent. Bezalel is no more. All that remains in the dimly lit chamber is blue and red light streaming through stained glass windows, filtered through the smoke hanging in the deathly still air. Emmett turns to me and says, Where'd he go, Joe? He has returned to the mind of God, my friend, I reply. We sit and stare into the smoke for a very long time. Emmett's story concluded. So there I was at Muldoon's, drinking a lukewarm bud, eating some pickled eggs, and watching the Mets lose another one from my usual table, when Alice brought me over a package we just got in at the office. Yeah, I was still using her place as my office, and she was still screening my calls. She's a sweet kid, really, and she gives me a discount now, so what the hell? Anyways, inside the package was a book with another postcard from Joey. This one had a picture of two smiling blondes with their melons spilling out of their overalls, way too happy about milking a cow. Gee, now that Joey remembers that he's a Jew, I hope he remembers to keep his meat away from the Dairy Queens out there in Wisconsin. The postcard says, Dear Emmett, just letting you know my book is finally getting published. I've dedicated it to you, by the way. I know you won't read it, but I'm sending it to you anyway. With love, Joe. A free copy, huh? Okay, Joseph. Free is good. Besides, it'll be nice to have a book around the office. It'll impress the clientele, for whatever that's worth. And I can always use it to kill those huge freaking roaches living in Alice's stove. So, I flip open the book. It's called Golem Stories by Josiah Lowenstein. And the dedication says, For Emmett, with whom I walked a Mobius strip in time, and from whom I learned that even the most improbable life can define itself through its deeds. So have a good life, my friend, or a bad one, your choice. Like they say in New Hampshire, live free or die. Death is not the worst of evils. J.L. It's nice to hear from Joey every once in a while. Before he took off, he told me that when I kept my word to him by coming to save him, even after he tried to sell me out, I proved that I did have a soul. Not too much sense, of course, but a soul. So when he cut my tattoo off, I was freed, not fucked. Well, I don't know about all that. But I guess if I was still some golemy type thingamajig... I wouldn't be sitting here at my regular joint with my very own girl reading a postcard from my very own pal and watching my very own Mets lose another one. You see, if I was really some kind of soulless monster, well, hell, then I'd be a Yankee fan. Author's note. The medication had just started to kick in, so I was no longer a palpable threat to my family. Still, I needed a creative release, so I returned to a literary form I had abandoned long ago. The short story. At that time, 2004 maybe, I was reading a lot of Neil Gaiman's work. I still do, in fact. 
and I had read Michael Chabon's Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay a few years earlier. I was also in the midst of a Jim Thompson pulp noir overload. So, with that stuff swimming in my head, I returned to a paragraph I had written some years earlier, 2002, about a tough guy in a bar fight who was thinking about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that I had written after seeing the play Copenhagen by Michael Frayn. When I had originally written that paragraph, the tough guy seemed a combination of Ralph Meeker in Kiss Me Deadly and Benjamin Grimm, the ever-loving blue-eyed thing. He was also based on a lot of the Nietzsche I had read in my youth, with existentialism still maintaining its romantic hold on me, but I had no idea who he was or who he was talking to or why. But when I returned to that paragraph some years later, I'm a pack rat, I never throw anything away, I finally figured out he was a golem. Thank you, Mr. Shabon. Once I had the golem, I had a mythology to research, which gave me a lot of stuff to read and think about, and a great way to avoid the actual writing. Because writing is hard. The golem led me to Rabbi Lowe and the Kabbalah. I realized then that the golem and the rabbi had their own views on their relationship to each other, and that if I was going to explore the Heisenberg metaphor about the uncertainty of truth, I would need not just an unreliable narrator, but two unreliable ones that saw things differently, with no omniscient narrative voice dictating what the truth was. The omniscient God, in fact would be the villain of the piece, in the figure of God's agent, Bezalel. That's what it was. That established the triangle, Emmett, Joey, and the Beals. From there, it was mostly about structure and narrative mechanics, creating sub-chapters to establish alternating voices, something I had seen in a Faulkner novel, intercutting selections from Lowe's future textbook to actually create expository flashbacks, reminded me of Dune, having the scenes get shorter to build in tempo. I find dialogue easy to write once I've identified the characters, so that is where I was able to have fun and heighten the humor while further delineating the characters through their distinctive voices. Still, I didn't quite know where it would end until the Yankee fan joke occurred to me. That's when I knew my story had a button, as they say in showbiz. Emmett had a four-year gestation period, if you include the writing of that first paragraph, sending various drafts over the years to people whose judgment I trusted to get their feedback, and finally through the rewrites requested by the editor of Abyss and Apex. Those edits were a bit contentious, in that I don't think the editor initially got what I was trying to achieve, though she enjoyed the story enough to want to publish it. But it was a first effort for me, and perhaps I was too precious about it. Certainly the stories I've written since have been less painfully labored over. The pain was worth it, however, in the response that I've gotten to the story, including glowing reviews that gave me the courage to write more. And so I have. And I thank you for listening. Okay, everybody, welcome back. A cast list for today's story. No! Yes. Cast list for this story. No, we don't do cast lists anymore. Optimus (laughs) Prime said... Optimus Prime said nothing about it. Uh, okay. Autobots. In order of their how their names appear in the story title, <laughs> Emmett was played by Rish Outfield as well as the Beals and Jesus. Uh, Joey was played by Big Anklevich. Alice was played by Juliet Bowler, as she was also a narrator for several sections. And Belzan was played by Rich Girardi. I'd like to thank everybody who helped us out uh, in voicing this story and getting the stuff together for that. Um, that was a, a bit of a lengthy story, huh? It's, it's kind of longer than what we normally do, but not hugely so. It seems like we do long stories fairly frequently when it comes down to it. I guess it's just because that's as much as, as it's extra work to do a story that's that long. Those are the kind of stories we tend to like better for some reason. It gives you more time, I think, to uh, do characterization and then all that kind of stuff. You can get more out of a longer story than you can out of a dinky little uh, shorty piece. Well, yeah, I don't tend to like flash fiction very much. And we are one of the only fiction markets that will look at a story over 5,000 words. That's true. And I think this one was 7,000 or more. I do want to tell the folks the long, sordid tale of getting this on the air. 
Or is there a long sorted tale? I don't think it's that Basically, sorted. Basically, you just gave it to the wrong producer. <laughs> the wrong producer begged me to be able to do it more like it. Well. You loved this story. You, you, you uh, latched on to this story like one of those little baby koalas, I think they are, where they're like born and they're like little pink slithery looking things and they latch on to the fur of their mother and they just stay there and they stay there as they keep growing and growing till they're finally like a year later big enough to actually uh, go out on their own it was kind of like that funny you should mention a year later <laughs> at one point we kicked around the idea of having this be our last story of 2010 our, yeah our... it was going to be like a christmas ish episode although it's not necessarily christmasy Jewishness. Yeah, it could have been our Hanukkah episode. Our Hanukkah story. And this was the one, I think we mentioned recently in an episode, this was the one where we wanted to do the Skype episode. Yeah. We were going to get all four of us that did voices, we were going to try and get us on a Skype call where we could do it like the table read that you you mentioned before, where we, we would just read it as we would go. And then if we didn't like it, we could say, hey, no, why don't you do it this way instead? Oh, no, why don't you do it that way instead? And ultimately, it just was too much work to get that to happen. Right. I think we started trying to organize that around October. And we're like, okay, <laughs> what night in October can we all be around our computers? Okay, what, what night in November can we all be? All right, I know the holidays are upon us, but is there a <laughs> night this month that we... And then finally, I just asked Rich and Juliet if they would read it themselves. But I gave them detailed notes because I, I really, I had planned to direct this like it was a play, mm. like it was a live radio show kind of thing. Uh -huh. So I just sent them my notes and uh, they recorded it and sent it to me and months went by until I finally got it done. And, and I know that Ralph was, uh, well, Ralph was very patient with us, but uh, I am sorry. It's just, um, it's not easy. It's, it's funny. Uh, we're producing our own episodes less and less because we have all these awesome volunteers that are willing to take a story off our hands. And it almost makes it harder than it ever was before when it's our turn to edit. Have you felt that way? A little bit, yeah. It's, it's easy to put off. It's easy to say, well, mine's not next. Mine's uh, two or three down the road until all of a sudden yours is next. And you're like, oh, crap. Well, we got this one that's already done. Let's move it up. <laughs> I, I found myself doing that. I remember with Catastrophe Baker was the uh, one where I was supposed to be doing it next. You know, that was the next one. And I had like three weeks, four weeks to work on it. And two weeks went by and I found other things that needed to be done more first. Uh, and I kept finding other things and finding other things until it was like the week it was supposed to air. And I still hadn't finished editing down just the raw file yet, much less doing any sound effects or anything else in it. And so I had to jump on the horse and ride at full gallop to try and get it done. I don't know why it's always that way, but that always is the way I seem to do it. And you, you know, you put together all the episode parts on all the shows. So you may say, oh, yeah, we don't produce it. But you still have plenty to edit all the time. You've got much more of an excuse than I do when it comes down to it. Well, as you said before, I did really respond to this particular story. I think it was my final exam of the last year. Final exam was that one story where it's like, ah, oh, look, somebody right. sent this to us. And uh, I jumped up and down. I don't know what it was about the story that so grabbed me, or but, but you've just heard the story, and hopefully it speaks for itself, just how much fun it is. And then, you know, the, the surprises, and then it's got a voice that's unique mm -hmm. and amusing as hell. And you know how sometimes when I'm with you and I'm trying to nudge the conversation in a certain direction, I'll say, we can go this way or we can go that way. <laughs> right. I've got one of those right now. Okay. Well, what, uh, an unusual take that I had on the story was obviously in one of our readings, you would read the voice of the big burly ladies man, tough guy. <laughs> And I would read the voice of the spindly, geeky, high-pitched loser character. Uh -huh. And for some reason, I said, no, let's switch that. Let's, let's cast against type and see if we can pull it off with you doing Joey and me doing Emmett. Whereas just naturally, you would expect me to be Joey and you to be Emmett. 
And so I, I thought it would be fun to talk a tiny bit, just for a minute, about casting against type. Uh -huh. Because uh, instantly coming to mind are two examples, and I, I don't imagine you've seen either of these movies, but one is uh, the Terry Gilliam film The Brothers Grimm. Okay, I have seen that, actually. Okay, and so that's a film about two brothers, uh -huh. one played by Heath Ledger and one played by Matt Damon. One of them is a, a smooth Lothario ladies' man, and the other is introspective and poetic and, and nervous. And, and obviously, obviously, Heath Ledger would be the ladies' man, and Matt Damon would be the, the misunderstood poet. But for some reason, at the very last second, the actors thought that it would be fun to switch their parts. And so you've got this wildly uneven flick where Matt Damon is this swaggering, confident Casanova, and Heath Ledger is this, oh, someday I'd love to be loved like my brother. And it doesn't work for a friggin' second. <laughs> the other movie that comes to mind is uh, The Other Boleyn Sister. Okay, that one I haven't seen. All right. And that, you've got two sisters, Anne Boleyn and her sister... Gretchen. I, I can't remember the name of the sister. The other Bolin sister. The other sister. Bolin sister. She wasn't important enough to give a name to. And one of them is this super sexual, almost predatory woman who, you know, uses her feminine wiles to get her way and claw her way up English society, a royal society. Mm -hmm. And then the other is a demure, innocent, virginal, sweet young lady who is, is overshadowed by her sister in everything. And they cast Natalie Portman and Scarlett Johansson in these two roles. But for some insane reason, Natalie Portman is the sex pot. And <laughs> Scarlett Johansson is the sweet virginal, oh, it would not be proper. Oh, I'm such a good girl. Character. But what's amazing is somehow that works. Now, I don't know if Portman is such a good actress that you buy her as just a femme fatale kind of thing. And Scarlett Johansson has only her sexuality, has only her looks and all that stuff going for her. I mean, every movie we've ever seen, we're just like, oh, okay, that's cool. But somehow she reigns it way, way in. And even though th these girls don't look anything alike, and you see the two of them, and yeah, one of them obviously should be the woman that's pulling guys away from their wives and things like that. And yet I, I totally bought that there was a ruthless nastiness to Portman's character mm -hmm. where you're just like, whoa, she doesn't care about anything but herself. She doesn't care who she hurts or who she tramples on and kind of thing. I bought it. I don't, I, I don't know. It's just one of those things where I would never have cast them in that way. Mm-hmm. And yet it worked. And maybe you can think of, of something like that where somebody was cast against type and you're just like, wow, that did not work. Or wow, that somehow, crazily, that did. I don't know. Anytime you mention that, it makes me think of Steve Buscemi who has longed and longed and longed for something other than the creepy dude roles that he always gets. I'm trying to think if there was ever a time when they gave him something that wasn't so creepy. Wasn't he the voice of somebody on an anime? Was he the voice on Monster House? He was man. the old man in Monster House. He was also the chameleon in Monsters, Inc. The old man on Monster House wasn't a particularly creepy guy. He was just an old guy that was uh, lonely, sad, etc. So he wasn't a bad guy, per se. He was just kind of a sad guy. Bad girl, looking like the sad girl. No um. pain, please! So Wow, I, he doesn't usually speak up when it's you singing. <laughs> well, when it's me singing disco, he'll speak up. <laughs> oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> oh, anyone, thank you, announcer man, actually. Anyone's been singing me disco for that matter. <laughs> I guess at this day, you haven't heard the episode, so you can't say whether it works or not. Maybe that's for the audience to decide. I haven't heard it yet, but when we read it, I thought you did fine. And when it comes down to it... In your mind, you may see us as being those particular characters because I am taller than you are and larger than you are. Beefy. Beefy. But nobody sees us. They just hear our voices. When it comes down to it, you've got a deeper voice than I do. My voice is Kermit-like. Your voice is Fozzie-like. Okay. 
and and I wonder if people think that we cast against type every time, and this is the first time we've ever finally done it right and given me the high pitched voice, which I already have anyways, and given you the deeper voice, you know, the guy that should be tougher. Okay, well that that may be so. I, I might be too close to us. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, didn't you ever read Lord of the Rings in high school? <laughs> I go back to what you were in high school and what I was in high school. And yeah, I just, I'm a lot closer to Joey in reality than Emmett. Mm-hmm. And when somebody imagines Emmett, I would think that they would imagine a beefy dude like you. Beefy. Um, it's funny. There's, uh, I listen to a sports talk radio now and then. And on one show, I think it's the Dan Patrick show, when you call up, you're supposed to say your measurements or whatever, and then they ding a little bell like you're a, a boxer or something. So you're like 6'4", 250 or something, and they go ding. And then if you're a big dude, though, they always go beefy. <laughs> Instead of ding? Well, they do the ding, too, but then one of the guys afterwards goes, mmm, beefy. Gross. <laughs> Makes me laugh, the fact that you've said beefy twice now. <laughs> to go along with that all right well just the the reading was so fun i don't know if you read this originally in abyss and apex or in kaleidotrope if the characters voices were so strong probably it works on text as well but i just i was so amused by just the way these people talked and juliet did a take where she was constantly chomping her gum while she was talking and doing her accent like this and that. And then one where, you know, where she reined that in. The, the constantly one was so obnoxious and so hard to listen to. You're just like, oh, can you imagine a woman that's, you know. <laughs> that's really like that. She's like, you know, now am it. I, I can't even do it. Because she probably must have put something <laughs> yeah, in her mouth for the smacking. Probably really had gum in there. She gave a couple of different performances on that. And then she tried to do... Alice pretending to be a receptionist, but it's still Alice's voice underneath. So she's sort of squelching her accent, you know, (laughs) trying to be our Emmett Kowalczyk's office, you know, trying to not say office. And that was really fun. She did several takes and and a lot of them were funny. The reading on this, we laughed a lot. And you, for some reason, came up with this crazy accent that you were going to do for, you know, Joey's story. I can't do it. (laughs) Do it. It's unlike any accent I've ever heard, except for maybe that strange voice you did for the bells of St. Mark's, Uh, Andrews, Tommy Jones. All on St. Mark's Eve. Ding. Beefy. We'd just say Emmett Jerry and the Beals in that same voice. (laughs) Emmett Jerry and the Beals. Was it anything like that? It was almost exactly like that. I don't know. That whole casting against type thing that you're talking about, if you feel that you just have a hard time playing that kind of, not so much, you know, we, we hear your voice, it sounds like whatever it sounds like, but if you feel like you have a hard time playing that tough sounding guy, since you don't imagine yourself as that kind of a person in any way, and that's why you feel like it's a, a stretch. I guess so. I it, I don't think I could play Emmett in a film or play of of this story because I just I don't fit the bill physically. What if you wore one of those Halloween costumes that has like the stuffed muscles and then you put that over your shirt so you looked like really buff? Or you put those under your shirt, I should say, not over your shirt because then it would give it away when you have that Captain America outfit on. I don't know. It's just <laughs> as voice performers or what what do you want to call us what are we uh, are we just voice actors or we voice you could say voice actors we get to play a hell of a lot more parts a lot wider range of parts than we would be able to as actual actors right film actors because you have to look the part in a lot of cases too. and yeah uh steve buscemi you brought him up he's a good example he has a particular look and he's not gonna fit the bill for some of these parts you know if it's like we're looking for a matthew mcconaughey type uh, have you considered steve buscemi that doesn't come up but in audio If you're talented enough, I think you can sound like you sounded like a little spindly, geeky, annoying, high pitched dude. Uh And, you know, to me, that's impressive. I mean, it sounds like I'm uh, tooting my own horn here, but I'm I'm actually trying to compliment you. You're just tooting. Yeah. (laughs) There has been a lot of tooting tonight. 
But uh, hopefully R O eight O T will uh, kindly edit that out for us. Uh-uh. And I've said this before on the show, but maybe I'll say it again. Your growth as an actor has been really impressive, especially sitting across from you these three years. Yeah, well, watching yeah, you go from zero to wherever you are now to to parsec. Nominated. Oh, parsec nominated. Although the only review of our show said, what the hell was with that guy that played that one? Oh, he sucked. He sounded like Kermit. You know, let's, let's, uh, let me address that, though. If we had done a Southern accent that's supposed to be a Southern accent from Civil War era, I think that that would have been even more distracting because nobody talks like that today. Yeah, it wouldn't have been And weird. it wouldn't have been as genuine. You'd have to have focused on the accent rather than the performance. Sometimes that is trouble when you're doing an accent that's hard. I mean, I, I have to admit I had to do that with this one. I think there was probably, and you, you would know better than me since you edited out all the mistakes, how many times I lapsed out of the accent because of this or that. You know, when you're trying to put emotion into your voice and do an accent that you don't normally do, it's difficult. Some of those folks that, you know, you hear about all the time that are just these great actors that everybody holds up on a pedestal and they're doing that while doing an accent, man, that stuff, uh, that should be doubly impressive. Somebody should automatically get the Oscar each year for acting well with an accent that isn't their own. You talk about Hugh Laurie who plays House and he's English. Have I told that story on the show? Probably. I think you've you've talked about him uh, several times. He's an Englishman, and yet he spends all this time trying to get his American accent on spot on so that, you know, you're not wondering what the heck's up with that guy to the point where he's doing it off camera. He's doing it all day long, so he doesn't ever accidentally lapse back into something wrong when he's on camera. And, you know, he's able to do a great performance while still in uh, this foreign accent this accent that isn't what he speaks like and uh that's that's hard stuff man put a good performance in with an an accent is really tough well i I think the trick is to make that accent a part of you yeah so that you no longer focus on it it's just there and what you're focusing on is the performance with house you've also got all this incredible medical jargon (laughs) right which is difficult. I mean, if it's half as difficult as Australian naval jargon, <laughs> it's twice as difficult as Emmett Joey and the Beals. Plus, Laurie does the limp and right. does it all friggin' day, you know, to the point where he wants, and it may be connected subconsciously to the accent. When he's doing the American accent, he limps and, and he just doesn't even think about it. But, you know, I've been watching that show for all these years and I'll watch it sometimes when you're not supposed to be noticing and the limp is still there. Like, you know, sometimes he's focusing on something else or, you know, there's a crisis or whatever and he doesn't even have the crutch. And I'm like, okay, let's see. And it's always there because his character doesn't just limp. He's in pain every time he moves that leg. And so, geez, the the, the work that's got to go into every detail of that to sound American, to sound like he knows what the F he's talking about medically, like, you know, to be the world's most brilliant doctor and then in pain. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that there are some accents that I can do much easier than other accents. For example, that Western accent that I've done the catastrophe baker for accent? catastrophe baker and for the cast of demon shadow I can pretty much do that without really thinking about it and so I'm able to put a performance in there whereas with an english accent or something else like that that isn't as natural to me I have to think more about making sure I say the words in the proper manner and uh, in doing so sometimes I'll lose the ability to do much acting on the uh, stuff as well and instead, I just pretend like I'm on Monty Python, and so everything comes out sounding like that. that. I think that definitely is something, you know. Certain American accents I can do well. You know, I can do a Southern or a Western accent pretty well. New York-type accent is so-so. Boston accent, it's out the window. That New England kind of accent, is that takes a lot of thought and concentration to keep that up. Although I think there was a time when I was going to try and get you to do that. I think it was for uh, that one story. The first time we were on uh, Drabblecast when we did that Squidges story, 
I think our characters were like the main brothers or something like that. Oh, and, and they were going to speak main. <laughs> and yeah, I was going to make us uh, do a Stephen King uh, imitation. And uh, you nixed that because I think you didn't feel comfortable enough doing it yourself. And so instead we were all like we were straight out of the backwoods, uh, North Carolina or something instead. Well, then maybe that's something we need to look for in a future story. Because, yeah, there are certainly voices accents that I do better than others. And I shy away from the ones that I'm not confident in because I don't want to sound like an idiot. When we did that story with the Scottish setting, Uh it was one of those, I wanted to duck my head during the whole thing because that was outside of our comfort zone. And as far as I remember, people didn't tear us a new one on that and say, F you guys, you sounded like shite. On many, many other episodes, they have said that. Yes, they have. But thankfully on that one where I was worried, because I've never known anybody from Scotland and and neither you nor I have ever been to Scotland. And okay, we have to do it in a Scottish accent because it takes place there and we're going to do our best. And people were, were, uh, what's the word? Supportive. People were generous in there. They were were patient. Yeah, they didn't uh, get upset about that one at least. And uh, when we're recording this right now, I don't know what the response to uh, Van Leeuwen Leeuwen was. Leeuwen. Leeuwen and the Gog. (laughs) But yeah, that's one where I basically did that whole story in an accent, and I mean, I hope the accent wasn't atrocious. Uh, I don't think it was. I, I but I listened to it very critically when well, he edited it, and and every time it sounded like me, like Rich Outfield, rather than that character. I was like, God damn it! But <laughs> it was a little atrocious because the author, after we recorded it, told us he was supposed to sound like Cletus the Slack Jaw Yoko. Oh, <laughs> Uh, what was it that Adam Sandler said? <laughs> I would have appreciated it if you'd brought this to my attention yesterday. Right. <laughs> I totally don't know how he could have thought that that... I think the guy says like bloody five times at least. So I don't see how he could have been Cletus the slack jawed yokel. But whatever. Well, yeah, we did our interpretation of that just like we did our interpretation on this. And, and Ralph may be impressed. He may not be. Maybe uh, horrified. Who knows? It, it, it's possible you'll be like, I waited a year for this. F- 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 you. Uh, but I don't think so. I, I, hopefully, it's just like when we were in film school and you everybody did a scene a different way or you wrote something and then somebody performed it. They bring something of themselves to it that you may not have intended, but it's a different point of view. And I don't know. Hopefully, he's impressed. If and uh, But also, hopefully, the audience enjoys the story it just it is a really good story yeah and maybe that shines through whatever we may or may not have done with van leeuwen hook okay i i don't know how it would have been with cletus slack jog yokel <laughs> doing it but uh, again hopefully the story itself comes through even if that that reading is totally not what he intended even if it's totally off that'll be interesting for you people in the past, you already know whether that was well received or not. And it'll be interesting to see what people thought of this. This also has an element to it that we don't usually do on the show. In our submission guidelines, we tell people, hey, you know, we want to shy away from religion, you know, pro-religion, anti-religion, my religion is better than yours, no religions are good. Well, you know, all those things. We try not to to bring that up at all because it's so divisive and, yeah. and, and you know how it's Everybody been. has a different opinion on it and it's easy to drive people away by presenting the opinion that doesn't agree with theirs. And so we just try to avoid it so that we can all get along. We went ahead and did this one anyways, although it does rely heavily on some Jewish uh, religious traditions. Yeah, and I hope that doesn't alienate people, but just the whole idea of the golem the Jewish folklore, I suppose, is really interesting to me. And I didn't grow up hearing stories about golems or anything like that. It wasn't, I was probably in my 20s when I first, I mean, they don't make movies about golems or anything, do they? Uh, (laughs) They made a movie about Gollum. They they did. (laughs) Uh, For a long time, I didn't know that Gollum was pronounced Gollum. No, I I didn't either. Gollum when I saw it. I think I read a Piers Anthony book when I was a teenager that included a Gollum, a Gollum in it. And it was, you know, some guy who was made out of wood and string and stuff like that. And he was little. 
you know, it seems like there's lots and lots of different interpretations of that. I even actually wrote a story two years ago. No, you didn't. For, <laughs> you just made that up. There ain't no story like that. Two years ago for our Broken Mirror episode, which included a, another takeoff of Golem where I said, you know, that they were Golems mixed with other bits of witchcraft and stuff like that. And they created something different. So it seems like there's lots of different ways you can go with it. There is the standard, you know, your Golem of Prague thing, which this story goes along with. And you see that on, I think, one of those Simpsons uh, Treehouse of Tree Horrors. Treehouse of Horrors. They did the Golem of Prague. And who was the Golem? Homer? No. It was an actual Golem that they had, and they were putting n- notes in his mouth to have him do stuff. And then finally they put a note in his mouth so that he can talk because he wants to talk. And so they tell him to speak. And he's like, Whoa, 500 years, and this is what you're doing. To-. You know, he sounded totally like your Saul Leibowitz voice. <laughs> I can't remember who did the voice. And then later he wants to have a wife. And so they get him a wife. And then they make her talk in its friend Drescher's Oh, voice. no. <laughs> it's so funny. And he's so happy that he's got friends. <laughs> Oh, it's uh, <laughs> it's so great. But uh, yeah, yeah, I've seen this, you know, the Golem of Prague stuff done here and there since I grew up. You know, once I hit my 20s or, or later is when I first came across this whole thing. And uh, I've heard or seen several different renditions on this. It's, it's so cool, though, a uh, concept for a monster, for a, a superhero, for for whatever it might be. It's weird that we don't see it. Is it because it's so Jewish identifiable? Maybe the Gentiles feel like people will be offended. So, let, you know, let's do a Pinocchio type story. This is almost the same thing. We'll do Bride of Chucky 4. <laughs> it's possible. I mean, maybe they feel like not enough people are included in that or something like that. Although I think when they were going to start up Seinfeld... There were studio people that said, I think this show is just too Jewish and people won't be able to get into it. So, you know, they couldn't have been more wrong about that. So, you know, it's funny, that kind of stuff that, you know, just just do it and see. I think a lot of times people say, oh, no, we're cutting off our target audience. But people don't have to be Jewish to to be a part of that. And when it comes down to it, of any minority that's out there, it seems like Jewish uh, traditions and stuff like that are the ones that are the most commonly portrayed in film and TV and movies and stuff like that. And I, I suppose that would probably be because there are a lot of uh, Jewish folks in production and stuff like that. But that may be your one that's the most easily embraced or most identifiable or something like that. It's just everybody seems to have at least seen something. And so they can kind of go with that. And maybe, I don't know what it is, but uh, it just seems like it's most prevalent at least. And maybe it also is because it's New York, and New York is the biggest city in the country. Everything is set in New York, and so there's always going to be one or two Jewish characters in every movie that's set in New York, because that's just the way it is. I don't know. I can't say because I'm not Jewish, and I'm sure you can't answer because you're also not Jewish. How dare you? None of you would be alive if it were for my David. <laughs> You know, we mentioned we shy away from religious stories. Is, does this count as a religious story or does this count as, like you said, Jewish folklore? Or is there even a difference? Is there, do they just kind of flow together? Shlemiel, Shlamazel, Hassan Pepper Incorporated. That's what I'm saying. I, I hear you. I think that's open to interpretation. I wanted to write a story about a wizard, an evil wizard, and he created golems out of out of dirt out of mud to serve him to be his slaves and i spoke to my one jewish friend and i was like oh is is this gonna bother people are are people (laughs) gonna are people gonna be bothered by this because the bad guy has golems and golems are are traditionally jewish identifiable and yeah he's like you can't use golems that's our word (laughs) i was just like what really and he's like no i don't care but still i never had the question answered (laughs) Story didn't really go anywhere, but I just I, I like the idea of animating the earth or animating clay or animating uh, something dead mud. Well, not Wood. not not dead because that suddenly becomes right you know, a zombie, zombie. But I'm not saying dead either. But something that was never alive, I should say, inanimate objects. 
It's like uh, the Sorcerer's Apprentice, which brings these brooms to life to dump the water for him. Of course, it all goes wrong. It seems like that kind of stuff always does. Although in this case, no. It took a while, though. Yeah. True. That's, that's, that's another thing that I really like about this story is just the spell or whatever the equivalent to a spell is that was on Joey and Emmett made it so it was always seven years. Just seven years ago, that they first made their deal with the Beals. And so it had been hundreds of years. But in their minds, it was always just seven years ago. And to me, that, wow, that was another thing where it's like, that is so <laughs> cool. And, you know, that's something that I could only appreciate after having read it through the first time. Because, you know, you'll mention, or Joey mentions, it's just, oh, a few years ago that we, we made this bargain. And you know it wasn't just a few years ago. It was you know, centuries ago. 70 times 7, wasn't it? It was something like that, yeah. Like, was, is that 490? It was my understanding. There would be no math. Uh, <laughs> during, uh, I don't know if I've said enough about the story. It sort of speaks for itself. I, I hope that other people like it. And that's something that I was just talking about today with you, with my own stories. Is I don't know what people are going to think, whether it's good or bad. And with each episode that we put out, there have been two or three that people latch on to and particularly like. But it's not always the episode that I was like, oh, I'm most proud of that one. Mm -hmm. Oh, we really hit it out of the park on that one. I was like, oh, I, I sort of bunted on that one <laughs> uh, to keep it. <laughs> what a baseball, silly bunt. <laughs> baseball metaphor. Oh, what a silly bunt. Uh, spider bunt. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope that people like it. What, what is it that you're always saying? If people like this story half as much as I liked it, I still... Liked it twice as much as that. Wait. Yes. Wait. Yeah. If you've enjoyed listening to this story just half as much as we enjoyed making it, then we've enjoyed it twice as much as you. There you go. Thank <laughs> you. And I certainly feel that way on this. It was an honor to be able to do it. I feel like I'm getting to the point. I'm getting old enough where I don't want to produce any more stories. <laughs> where it's like, uh, I started this one in November or something uh -huh. like that. And here it is. Jeez, it's June. And it finally hits the air. And, and also when somebody else produces a story, if there's something that I don't like or something that I would have done differently, I always have that. Uh, I would have done it a different way, but okay. But when it's me, there's no excuse. If it doesn't work or if there's something that's not perfect, I'm like, ugh. And that's another challenge that we have doing this week to week is it, no episode can be perfect. You can't. And if you try and say, okay, this one's going to be absolutely perfect, then it takes six months right. like this does. And it's still not perfect. You know that. Uh -huh. I don't know on things like that. You know, collaborative art like film or podcasting, I guess, is something where you don't have the luxury to fiddle with it until it's perfect. You just got to get it out there because you have other people. You have Ralph wondering where his story is. I mean, I told him in 2010 it would be airing. But if you're a sculptor, if you're a painter, if you're a novelist, I guess you can take three years to do your art. But even then, it's never going to be perfect because it's created by human beings. And you'll be too close to it to see. I mean, how many times have I proofread something over and over again and I give it to you and you're like, yeah, there's three typos on the first page. The correct answer is seven. Seven, seven? times that has seven happened. Seven times 70. <laughs> Indeed. Yes, it's a huge number. <laughs> but there's no math, so I didn't want to mention that. I don't know. I will be silent and let you talk for a moment. Really? Probably not. That was this one time at camp. What did you do with your flute? <laughs> um, all right. Uh, There's nothing you want to say about it? Uh, just, just along the lines of what I said an hour ago, uh, one of our rules has been that we won't. Did you just flip me off? <laughs> uh, we won't podcast a story if it has been podcast on another show if it has been previously podcasted hot. but i'm sure there are stories that have been done on one show and then picked up on another show and, and done there and that could be really interesting to compare and contrast different readings and different takes i mean we have music and we have sound effects and we have 
full cast right. on ours. So it can be very different than if it's just a solo read or if it's a bunch of other people with different sensibilities, different priorities of how they want to do it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes on things like this, it would be really interesting to hear how other people have done it. I, there was a story that we won't mention the author that was submitted to us and read through, uh, not recorded, but then sold to another podcast before we could do it. Yeah. And I have to admit, I was really critical of that reading, <laughs> partly because it had several characters and I felt like it would have been stronger to have a different reader for each character because it keeps it straight. It makes it easier. It's, it's almost a shorthand. You don't have to say Elizabeth said, Tony said, Elizabeth said eight times if you've got a female voice and a male voice mm -hmm. and all that. When I listened to it, it was frustrating to me because I was like, oh, you know, we would have done it a different way. Although, who's to say that we would have done it better? Yeah, that's true. It's not, not necessarily so. It ain't necessarily so. so. The one thing, you know, we don't do stories that have been previously podcasted, but that doesn't mean the other folks wouldn't do a story that was on our show first. So I guess there is the chance that someday down the line, somebody might do another rendition of a story that we did on our show and we could compare and contrast that. Wouldn't that be sort of like Gus Van Sant directing Psycho? Did you really say that? Or Michael Bay doing a North by Northwest remake. Good night, folks. No, or not. Not at all like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, I, I know that you say when somebody podcasts a story that you've already heard podcasts somewhere else, you won't listen to it again. But have you ever listened? And it's like, whoa, and that's so weird. And it sounded like a totally different story. There's been a time or two, but it, I've never been blown away by anything. There's, usually it's far enough apart from the other time that I've heard it that I don't remember it. And it's like halfway or at least partway in before I finally realize, hey, I've, I've heard this one before. Yeah. And sometimes I'll stick with it anyways, even though I've heard it before. And other times I'll just be like, let's get on to the next one. I'm so far behind. That saves me 30 minutes. And, that, and that's understandable, that's especially true. when you have a limited amount of time. That's usually the reason why I do that is because on some podcasts, I've got like a 40 episode backlog that I haven't listened to and I do have a lot of time to listen to stuff in my car because I've got a long commute but still it's only so much and there's lots of things that I'd like to listen to like right now I put podcasts on the back burner because I've got an audiobook that I'm listening to and when I'm done with those eight CDs, I've got another audiobook to listen to. And then when I'm done with those eight CDs, then I could probably get back to my <laughs> podcast. But there is always that opportunity cost. You want to do something twice. Well, there's the time that you could have used on something else. And then you've lost that opportunity. It wasn't worth it. Basic economics, I believe. It was my understanding there would be no math <laughs> in these proceedings. <laughs> Well, you can see it in the many adaptations of A Christmas Carol or Romeo and Juliet or uh, the, the Bill Pullman version of It's a Wonderful Life. You know, they're, they're different retellings of the same story. The Kermit the Frog version of It's a Wonderful Life? Is there? There is. Can, can you give me an example of how that might sound? <laughs> sure. Kermit runs around and he says, Merry Christmas, Mr. Potter. Merry Christmas, old building and loan. And Happy New Year to you, Kermy, in jail. <laughs> the compare and contrast of that stuff is really interesting. Like when there's an original film in a different language and then they do the American remake and you uh -huh. watch both of them. Or every once in a while, like with the Exorcist prequel or something like that, where they actually make the movie twice. To me, that's totally fascinating. I, I think you and I sat and watched the Richard Lester Superman oh, 2 right. and the Richard Donner Superman 2 on the same night so that we can compare and contrast. And, and to me, we were done, we said, here are the results for Lester. <laughs> Not. <laughs> uh, I don't know if other people find that as interesting. But as an experiment, as like a film student-esque kind of thing, I certainly know in our film school, people were assigned like the same scene. Go film this, but in your own way. And people, depending on how they cast it, depending on where they set it, how they decided to read the voices, maybe in accents and that, they could be very, very different. Now, I wasn't in that class, but I don't imagine it would be boring you're on the third time watching this same story told. 
uh, we had competing, we had dueling monkey's paws my senior year of That's college. Right. I think I, I mentioned that on the monkey's paw episode. And why? Why, if you know somebody else is making an asteroid about to hit Earth movie, <laughs> would you do it? It's like, why would you make No Strings Attached and Friends with Benefits at the same time? But these things always happen. And it is interesting. It's fun to say, okay, this was the superior version. Or last year they had that movie with Tom Cruise and Cameron Diaz and the exact same movie with Katherine Heigl and Ashton Kutcher that came out almost the same time. It's fun to say, okay, this was the superior guy. Yeah, I need to see the Ashton Kutcher one. I haven't seen that one yet. I did see the Tom Cruise one, though. Which was weird because I never really wanted to, but somehow we somehow just happened to be... It was a date night, I think you said. Yeah, and that was the one movie that everyone could agree on or something like that. And so we watched it and it wasn't bad. It had some good humor in it and stuff like that. Well, we had that movie Rio that came out really recently. And I believe it was your theory that Newt got axed by Pixar because it was the same premise. It was. Where there's an endangered species, a male and a female, and they're all that's left, and it's up to them to repopulate the species. But what happens if they don't hit it off kind of thing? You know, it's a shame if that was the reason that Pixar was scared off by that because you can seriously take that premise in any number of, of directions. And just because the log line is the same in the two movies, you know, an endangered species are forced to repopulate, but they don't get along. You could go in any direction and have any tone and any animal <laughs> in that. And it's just a shame that we don't have those to compare because, you know, Rio made a lot of money. Yeah. I think it was just because they were so much further behind Rio that they... Uh... Rather than pulling ants and just like bust it out as fast as they can to try and get it out first, they took the noble route and just said, you know, we'll try something else. We'll just make a Monsters Incorporated sequel instead because DreamWorks has shown us what we need to do and we'll just copy them. It's called Monsters University. Yeah. Oh, last year, I think it was, there was those two sperm switching movies that came out like the same time as well. The um, Wait, were, were these adult films? Sir? I... <laughs> you might think so, but one of them starred Jennifer Aniston. Ooh, the I... other one starred Jennifer Lopez. Oh, uh, the, 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 the switch is uh -huh. the Jennifer That's L Aniston. Aniston. I actually saw that one. I didn't see the Jennifer Lopez movie. You before. saw the switch? I did. Oh, I sort of want to see that. <laughs> and then, and the, the Lopez one is called the... The plunger, the the the, the baster, baster. No, no, that was the that was the switch's original title. <laughs> Tell me, what is it called? The backup plan. The back. Oh, yeah, it's on the tip of my. Tongue. I think they called it that because you know Jennifer Lopez got back, so it's the ah, backup plan. <laughs> lovely. <laughs> but yeah, those two are the same kind of thing, and yeah, I did see the uh, Aniston Bateman version. Which was pretty good, although in the end it was all resolved a little too easily, which uh, kind of bothered me a bit. It was one of those movies where they shouldn't get together at the end because there was too much in the way. should be like chasing Amy and then she just walks away and that's the end. But yeah, you know, they're not going to do that. But they should have had 10 more minutes in the movie at least to resolve it. How did we get talking about this? I'm not sure. You started talking about other versions of po same oh, stories. Good point. And yeah. now we're the on Exorcist to the Exorcist prequels. It's so, yeah, I guess the point I was trying to make badly was Terribly. That, ter yeah, awfully. Hideously. Abominably. Say more words. <laughs> was that two different people or two different groups of people can have very different takes on the same subject. And, and sometimes it's worth looking at more than one take. And so I guess... Somebody wants to contact Ralph and ask that they can do their version. <laughs> they could. <laughs> What's done is done. The way that an episode comes together is the way that it comes together. And if somebody else produced it, it would have sounded very different. That's the joy of having these other people produce stories for us is, is sometimes there are happy accidents. Sometimes there are surprises, things that we couldn't have anticipated. We've made friends with people we never would have met had somebody else not asked them to do a voice on an episode they produced. Like Renee Chambliss That's right. does stuff for us all the time. We never even would have met her if it weren't for that one story that this, Brian, this must Brian be, got This her. must be the place. 
that was the one? That was her oh. first story with us. And I remember, yeah, when I got that from Brian and I listened, I was like, holy crap. Who is this narrator? She's amazing. It sounds like way too good to be on our show. How dare you? None of you would be alive <laughs> if it weren't for my Elise Krawick. Holy cow, dude. You're going way back. Yeah, we probably wouldn't. We'd all be dead. But we are so off topic. I, I sort of want to see that uh, Jennifer Aniston movie. Is she awful, though? Because I've found her more and more grating as the years have gone by. More, uh, maybe it's not irritating, maybe it's not infuriating, but it's a word that starts with eh. And it, it's oh, just, she's, yeah. she's just. It actually starts with the M, it's meh. She's so awful now, <laughs> where I see her in these things and it's just like, dude, lighten up. We used to love you on that NBC show. Why do you have to do that? You know, I just, I, I can't watch her now. She's not that bad in this show. For the most part, she's the more likable of the two. Jason Bateman is supposed to be this really pent up dude. She's supposed to be more of a free spirit type. When somebody's one of your deal breakers, it's hard to get over that and see them for whatever their character is. Instead, you're just like, nah, Jennifer Aniston, I can't stand you. Whether she's playing a nice character or not, you still can't stand her. When you can't gonna... stand him. <laughs> Chalupa for you, big. <laughs> All right, folks, I think uh, we've probably reached our end, or do you have more to say? No. You know, I apologize to anybody who's been sitting here for 90 minutes and realizing we're no longer talking about the story. Uh, you should hear the outtakes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, then then let's, let's bring this to a, a screeching halt. <clears throat> no more words will be said by me. <clears throat> Except for you have to say goodbye, Gracie. <laughs> Nazi. Hey, good night, folks. Thank you for listening all the way to the end of the show. I, again, have been Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Anklovich. See you later, folks. Do you have something to say about today's episode? Drop by our website at doonstief.com and leave a comment. If you're ever in a generous mood, we'd love it if you donated. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience. Take two. Who ep- who epidos so did this edit? God damn it. Who uh, posts... You're asking me no, who edited this episode when it was you that edited it? Are you really going to do that? No, sir. You're going to beg for me to acknowledge you? <laughs> Although we'll, we will have to refer to that at some point because that's why it didn't air for Christmas. All <laughs> <laughs> right. Yankee fan. Episode, what the hell? It's 104. Click. It says 105 here. What the five? Okay, welcome back, everybody. Are you ready for the cast list for today's story? Do we want to do a cast list, considering I so brutally replaced Rich Girardi? Who was Donald oh. Dunsty? Oh, right. I guess that would help, huh? Um, he was actually the first man to claim that he liked ABBA, ironically. I never... No, no. He was the first man to claim that he liked ABBA, ironically, oh. rather than actually liked ABBA for their music. Okay. So I don't know why I'm explaining it to you, since you <laughs> me, named the podcast. Let me say that again, then. Is it Shabon? I have no idea. I would say Shabon, but I don't know. Shabon! Shabon, Shabon. Shalalalalalalalalala. Has been an attorney with the Dramatists Guild of America. Should I say dramatist or dramatist? Damn you. It's just selfish to find out that I did three characters and you and everybody else did. It's not. Your characters are small. And so is your mind. At least you went with mind this time instead of... <laughs> I was reading a lot of Neil Gaiman's work. I'm sorry, Gaiman. <clears throat> and we're going to do our best. And people were... were uh, what's the word? Supportive. Not supportive, but they, you know, they, they, they're like, oh, you know, you guys did fine. They were not generous, but, uh. They weren't unkind. Well, I can't remember what the word is. I'm not sure which one you're. But, you know, it's reaching just. Reaching for, I'm afraid. Like if your daughter draws something 
and it's not very good, but you say, oh, hey, this, thank you. I'm going to put this up in my office or whatever. That's what you're being. You know, you're being supportive. You're being not patronizing necessarily. It's disingenuous. No, not even that. <laughs> it's just you You put your feelings aside because you realize, you know, it's like, hey, this came from the heart or whatever. Right. Anyway, I, I think people were supportive about that, like you said, or people were generous in there. They, they were patient. What was the switched sperm stories that came out last year, too? There was the one with Jason Bateman and Jennifer, Jennifer Aniston. Aniston which called was... The Switch. I don't think it was called The Switch. And then there was the one that had uh, What's-Her-Face in it, Jennifer Lopez, right? Yeah, it was originally called The Baster. <laughs> I was like, oh, you're kidding me. <laughs> None of you would have been alive if it weren't for Wendy Cooper. Matthew Scherzinger. Was he the guy that prevented me from taking my life? He was. <laughs> That's funny, but we are so off topic. Wendy's going to enjoy this because I think a lot of this will have to go in the outtakes. <laughs> but uh, the other night I was at a casino and they had a bunch of TV monitors above like the blackjack tables and stuff. And one of them was on like TNT and it was this Matthew McConaughey flick, but the sound was off and I'd missed the title. I knew it was one I hadn't seen, but he was out there with this just ridiculously hot chick and they go to, to his house and it turns out he lives with his parents. And I was just like, oh, I remember when this came out. I didn't see it because I don't see Terry those Bradshaw was his dad. Terry Bradshaw was his dad. And it, Kathy Bates was the mom. Did it have his naked butt on there? <laughs> no, because it's the TNT version. Oh, whatever. okay. But, but I was just like, oh, I remember this. And, and eventually Kate Hudson's going to come in and she's writing a, a newspaper article or whatever on how to fuck with men's brains. And, and somehow they're going to fall in love and he's going to be able to... I can only remember I the Spanish word. I think you're mixing uh, two movies together. I, I am. I totally am. Because the movie's called Failure to Launch. Yeah, a little while down the line, he meets the female lead of this movie. It starts with a J. It's a Jessica. Jessica Alba? No. Someone Jessica St Mrs. Mrs. Matthew Broderick. Matthew Broderick oh, is homosexual. Right. And he's got a beard. Right. Her name is... <laughs> uh, Sarah Jessica Parker. Okay. There you go. Can I leave Matthew Broderick as homosexual in the outtakes? If you want to. I don't care. Okay. I, I, he's not litigious like Tom Cruise, who is also homosexual. Uh, anyhow. Okay. So suddenly Sarah Jessica Parker shows up and it was just like, oh, okay. Now I can see why I never saw this movie. <laughs> and... It's weird because, you know, I think Catherine Winnick was the girl at the very beginning, probably one of the two best looking women in the world. And he ends up with Sarah Jessica Parker. And I was just like, oh, sorry, man. I'm going to watch the cards instead of the screen. Yeah, that's interesting how that kind of stuff goes. But yeah, you know, I actually saw some of that film as well. Um, my wife rented it and I know I didn't watch the whole thing, but I did see bits of it. And, uh, you know, when I was a kid... Terry Bradshaw was my friggin' idol. Oh, okay. I loved that guy. He was the quarterback for the Steelers that had just, you know, they'd won four Super Bowls in like the last six or seven years. And it, he was just the most amazing dude. And I still have a hard time. I, I assume he was like this all along. But when I was a kid, he was larger than life. He was this great, like, gladiator. You know, he was this mythic dude. And since those days have long passed, and now he's he's on the NFL Today show or whatever they call it, uh, NFL on Fox show or something like that. And he's just a clown. I was going to say such, clown. He's such a goofball. And it just... That's how I know him. I don't yeah. know him as a gladiator. Yeah, you I only know him as the silly punchline who would come on a sitcom and play this blustering dopey character yeah he's a, such a dope and I, I have a hard time reckoning that those two images together and how he could be this great quarterback that led his team to four super bowls in such a short period of time and made the steelers go from you know laughing stock of a team to to this day one of those teams that every you know it's one of the most loved teams in the country one of the biggest teams in the world really and they're from Pittsburgh, you know? It's not a place that people want to go to. It's a place that has lost so many citizens that the Pittsburgh Steelers have a huge away following because everybody that used to live in Pittsburgh now lives everywhere else. 
it's just weird to me for some reason to see that goofiness and to see Terry Bradshaw in this movie now. Did and you he's, say you, you, you see his butt? In yes, the, you see, do. I saw it on the television version, so tell me what I missed. They've been desperate to get rid of Matthew McConaughey. They want him out of their house because he's their son, and he's this adult son. He's still living with him, and that's the whole thing is Sarah Jessica Parker gets them to finally grow up and launch as it is, be the bird that leaves the nest, and then and Terry Bradshaw's been been waiting for him to finally move out of the house and once he moves out he's gonna have this special room and it's his naked room oh (laughs) and he could just be naked in that room anytime (laughs) he wants and they have a scene where he comes in and terry bradshaw's standing there naked and you don't you know you see his butt in several shots and it's just like terry bradshaw gladiator what are you doing being a clown again i still have a hard time with that for some reason well okay so this was 20 something years ago it was a long time was he a handsome man i don't think he was always bald because okay think about it kathy bates (laughs) plus terry bradshaw equals matthew mcconaughey (laughs) well terry bradshaw was the quarterback for the pittsburgh steelers so yes but there is but it's a steven tyler Liv tyler kind of thing how hot would the wife have to be to create a child that looks like Matthew McConaughey? Because I assume that he's the male equivalent of like hottest chick in the world. <laughs> I think he has been the... He's incapable of wearing a shirt. The People magazine number one sexiest, sexiest guy? Okay. guy at least once or twice. I don't know. I don't know if that's genetically possible. Well, but, but we are always saying... What must Liv Tyler's mother look like, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure those words well, have come from your mouth before. Steven Tyler looks a lot like a woman. But he's a freaking monster. I mean, he, he looks like a Meet the Feebles character. I mean, he's, he's, he looks like a dark crystal creation <laughs> where it's like, hey, uh, parents, you may not want to take your children to see this. <laughs> The, the Gelflings have like a grandmother that's particularly frightening and uh, does this thing with its voice where it goes, yeah! 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 Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll insert an Aerosmith sound on that. On that. Uh, so you might want to leave them home or at least cover their eyes. Yeah, I think Steven Tyler plays a pirate in Pirates of the Caribbean. I haven't seen it yet because it comes out as we're recording next week. But yeah, he was at the premiere at Disneyland along with Keith Richards. So Mm. I think that's just old pirates must be rock stars. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, well, because the pirates were infamous. Yeah. But they also led a romantic lifestyle and there was pillaging and I imagine... What rock and rollers do to <laughs> hotel rooms is the equivalent of pillaging. <laughs> hotel rooms and groupies is raping and pillaging. <laughs> that, that was Johnny Depp's take on his... That's why he does his character the way he did. Is He, he figured pirates were the rock stars of their age. So he is playing Keith Richards when he does Captain Jack Sparrow. And that was one of the main reasons why they got Keith Richards to be his father in the third film is after he confessed to that. That's something that's so weird because if I recall, they wrote that part for Hugh Jackman to play the Jack Sparrow character. Huh. Would have been quite different. And yeah, I can't. Well, it's indelibly Johnny Depp. Right. It's one of the, I mean, it's like Austin Powers or one of those characters that people call Johnny Depp Jack Sparrow now, you know, like they would call Mike Myers Austin Powers yeah. and that it's so intrinsically linked with the actor. But, uh, you know, I'm sure 22 years from now when they remake Pirates of the Caribbean <laughs> with somebody that's 10 right now, that'll be interesting. Right? That will be. Anyhow, uh, I guess we should thank Wendy for coming on this little journey with us <laughs> and go back to our regular episode. What do you say? I don't know. I think we've... Uh, uh, this is practically a that gets my goat <laughs> in how far off the mark we've gone and just continued with it. Because... You didn't have a heck of a lot to say until this very end of the episode, or maybe I didn't let you speak. I said my piece. But it's been fun to just say, okay, well, where is this going to take us? We're we're (laughs) talking about the backup plan, and now we're talking about, what was the movie called? Failure to Launch. Is that one that you suggest I see? Um, it's, It's hard because it's got Sarah Jessica Parker, and I despise. She's, I guess, one of my deal breakers. I can't stand her. So I'm sorry, you what? 
I can't stand her. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's hard to say. Yeah, see that 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 whole naked room thing I thought was really a funny idea. And despite the fact that I have a hard time reckoning the two images that I have of Terry Bradshaw together with that, it it was a very funny bit. And uh, uh, I, I think you'd probably not absolutely hate it for sure i mean you wouldn't be like oh i want my two hours back this is worse than west side story but i don't think you would be like writing home about it or doing three blog entries about it or anything like that oh you bastard well hey let's make a pact here today on the lives of your children <laughs> that we will do our deal breakers episode someday and and then and, and and again wendy since this is just for you Remind us sometime if, if time has passed and we haven't done our Deal Breakers episode. That was something we intended to do almost a year ago now. At least a year ago. Probably and more than that. Yeah, that's true. We talked about it years ago. But uh, somebody that if they are in a movie, I don't want to see that movie. And, uh, and Sarah Jessica Parker is on your list. It's weird because I don't like the other one, Kate Hudson, mm -hmm. at all. But... When I saw that it was Sarah Jessica Parker, I was disappointed. I was just like, oh, no, I thought it was Kate Hudson. It's not. <laughs> and so that's interesting. That there's a scale, a sliding scale of deal breaking. <laughs> there is. And yeah. So. One of the, probably one of the reasons we haven't done that deal breaker episode yet is because I have a hard time coming. I mean, if we talk and then we'll mention somebody, oh, yeah, I really don't like that person. But to sit down and just write a list up of them. I don't know if I could if I could come up with uh, the the a number of them, and I think we've mentioned that a couple times. We're like, oh, what about this guy? And I'd be like, eh. take him or leave him. Yeah, I'd be like, well, what about this guy? Eh. And they're like ones that should be obvious deal breakers, like Jean Claude Van Damme or Steven Seagal or something like that. And I don't know. They're that, not really a factor anymore. Yeah, I don't know that I could call them deal breakers because. I never watched any of their movies anyway, so they never were able to get on my nerves like a Sherry Jessica Parker does. Or, Well, I can't think of a lot of Sarah Jessica Parker movies that I've seen. So I don't know if she plays the exact same character in all of her movies, if she's the Sex in the City character. I don't even know if that Sex in the City character is intolerable or is, is annoying. Yeah, because I've never watched I don't it. know. But... Uh, we mentioned Catherine Heigl a little while ago. I used to really like Catherine Heigl. Mm -hmm. And now she's got this persona. She's become a movie star rather than an actress, which means she plays Catherine Heigl in every one of her movies. And it's always this really uptight, really difficult to get along with, spoiled, I think I'm smarter than you. Oh, I'm so disgusted by what you're doing. Persona. That, yeah, she has gotten onto my list. Not an absolute deal breaker, but it's like, oh, Catherine Heigl, uh, I'm probably not going to like that movie. And it's weird how that happens. I mean, I understand that you have a hit movie where you play a certain part. Anytime there's a part like that, they think of you. And you do two or three of those, and suddenly it becomes a Catherine Heigl type movie. Or once you're signed to do that part, you've got enough power where you're like, I'm going to make this character more like me. And that certainly seems to have happened with Jennifer Aniston. She, yeah. she, she has a certain number of characteristics that are actually her as an, a person that she brings to each one of these roles. But it just it, it becomes so grating and unlikable. And why that? Yeah, she is practically a deal breaker for me now. It's it's there are there are movies that I probably would see. There's a Gerard Butler movie with Katherine Heigl and a Gerard Butler movie with Jennifer Aniston. And I haven't seen either of them. And it's not because I don't like Gerard Butler. Sarah Jessica Parker. Stop it. Putting bad thoughts in my head. Her head just seems not to go with the body. It, it almost seems too large or too... Yeah. Sorry, did I distract you? Of course you did. <laughs> okay, bye, Wendy. Thanks for listening to the outtakes. Oy vey, now you come to the Dunsty Folio Fiction Magazine. Stop it, you're embarrassing me. There's the door. How many times do I gotta repeat myself? Okay. Emmett, Joey, and the Beals by Ralph Savish. Emmett's story. So there I was, yet another brawl at Muldoon's Bar and Grill. Okay, how do we want me to do this? What do you think? Is sure. Does it sound too much like an old rabbi? <laughs> he has imparted to me his knowledge 
of the mystical arts and secret alchemies of Kabbalah, deciphered from the sacred book, the Book of Splendor, the Sefer Yetzirah, the Zohar. Don't mess with the Zohar. Old Jew Muldoon. And he has this slightly retarded fella, Jesus. <laughs> and he has this slightly retarded fella, Jesus. Hey, Jesus. 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 I know how to say it in Mexican. How is I'm trying to think a New York Jew would say it. He's going to say it right. Everybody knows Jesus. Oh, just for that, I'm going to say, hey, Jude, don't make it bad. I'm sorry, but Mr. Kowalczyk is not currently available. See, I want her to uh, really sit on that accent for when she's the secretary answering the phone, but you can still kind of hear it in certain mm -hmm. words. And then the second she hangs up, she's like, Oh, Emmy, I've got the accent up the ass. <sighs> sure. Okay. Ten bucks. Ten? A day. A day? I sit up so quick I hit my head on the shelf above the bed. You mean on top of... Uh... Alice, you have no idea. I'm stuck between the devil and the deep blue sea. I'll come back to bed, sweet cheeks. I still got three minutes left on the meter. Ooh, you sweet talker. <laughs> but I can't walk to Wisconsin. The ulcers on my feet would get... Can you have an ulcer on your feet, I guess? Maybe? <laughs> I thought that was a stomach thing, but I don't know. That's funny. The book. Really? In exchange for a free pass. There is a pause Did on the... Did you do that a little... You sounded like the woman there. Do it with just... <laughs> <laughs> they are so close to the problem. Madison, Wisconsin, yes. They have Aryan girls there, That's Joseph. That's right, Aryan. That's what I'm after. I want some of that action. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> they say the Aryan girls got the best milking skills. They say the northern girls, with the way they kiss, they keep their boyfriends warm at night. That's right, Mr. Belzon. I bet you've been there with Belzon before. That's a very personal question. <laughs> and then them Aryan girls look at your bells off. You're a sick man, Joseph. Yes, I am. I'm a damn heroin addict. What do you think? <laughs> and it came to pass that Lo, who was a good and decent man, heard the cries of his people, the Jews of Prague, who were decimated by hate, by deprivation, by pogrom. What in the hell does that word mean? I've seen that before. It's a disease of the ass. <laughs> oh, man. He studied the sacred Zohar. He messed with the Zohar. <laughs> Do not mess with the Zohar. Joey's story continued. You will know it is time to turn the page when you hear Joey whine like this. I shouldn't have done it. Every inch of my mortal flesh screamed a warning to me. The deep reds of the stained glass put me in mind. The deep reds of the stained glass put me in the mind. Oh, damn it. In mind of the. The deep reds of the stained glass put me in mind of the blood of the innocents spilled over and over throughout time. And the light blues recalled a sky as seen by a sea of dead and empty eyes staring lifelessly up through their mass graves. From their mass graves? Oh! What did I say? Through. Oh, damn. And the light blues recalled a sky as seen by... Well... You'll never get it. Never! His long beard partly obscures his... <laughs> That's too much. That's how the girl talks. That's not how you talk. <laughs> How uh, is Bezalel's voice? Well, he's older. He wears a seersucker suit. I but think he, he should sound like Colonel Sanders. <laughs> with a southern accent. <laughs> Hello, Judah. Good to see you. Maybe. <laughs> no. Low Drew's charts calculated his numbers, spoke his incantations, made his prayers, and, with the elements of fire, water, and wind and earth, fashioned a man out of the mud of the riverbank. No, not a man. A golem. I've never heard you do that voice before. <laughs> Silent and mighty, the golem defended the Jews of Prague, but, lacking a soul, the golem had no mercy, no compassion, no humanity. And in the exorcism... 
that in exercising a fierce vengeance, it became a monstrous, unstoppable killer. That was really cool. <laughs> I'm impressed. We've got to come up with an excuse for you to do that voice. That doesn't sound like Kermit, and it doesn't sound like anything you've ever done before. <laughs> I lifted Belzan's phone number off Alice's caller ID, and then I made sure to joke about it with Joey. Oh, hold on a sec. Chingasso. I know that's probably not a Yiddish word, but uh, the one that's come to mind. I love when that thing bounces. Bounces like a fat girl's titty. Or, you know, well, shapely, thin girl, too. Titty's the most important part. Bouncing and the, the titties. bouncing, yes. Please follow the bouncing titty. Ready? All together. Sure, Joey, I understand. Sure, Joey, I understand. How, 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 how is Jesus talking? Sure, Joey. Yeah, Joey, you got it. Sure, Joey, I understand. Do that again, but you were kind of way past Joey, the microphone when jo- you were saying it. Jose, Jose, Joey. <laughs> I can't say Joey. Sure, Joey. Sure, show. Sure, Joey. I understand. Lo, the golem must be stopped. Okay, now I can't have my accent here, huh? Yes, master. I have lost control of it. Your control was it? <laughs> Suddenly, <laughs> evincing a great and damning hubris, Bezalel he messed with this so hard. But you learned most of your racial slurs from me, right? Probably. Not as much a connoisseur of racial slurs as you are. I really like racial slurs. As you know by calling me a connoisseur. Ah. How dare you? Well, it was for you. My legs are cold like I'm not wearing pants, but I am wearing pants. Friggin' cold. I need to go turn up the heater or something. When I finally snap out of it, Joey is slicing off a tongue. Ew. <laughs> his tongue? Oh, crap. I didn't know he had tattooed his tongue. That's fudged up. Bursts into flame, too. And his blue, blue fire intertwines with the red, red flames of the Zohar. Which we really messed with this time. The end. Thank you very much for listening to this reading of Joey Emmett and the Bills by Ralph Sevouche. <laughs> Stay. Bark, bark, wagtail. Good boy. Good boy.